is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on at God Tell. That was a paid political announcement, paid for by the candidate of your choice, me. Some of you people have got to learn to smile. It's a choice. You don't have to feel like it, just do it. Everybody now on the count of three, smile. One, two, three. And try that on for some. Okay. Oh boy. Some of you people are going to be shocked when you meet God and find out he has a sense of humor. And God's going to be laughing. And you're going to say, God, why are you laughing? And he's going to say, look in the mirror. And then you'll laugh too. We, are, we don't have any lights over here. Is, can I turn these on? No, I turned them off over here earlier, Martin. They're on back there. I know what I'm talking about. I'm a mechanical engineer, see? Uh-huh. Fooled you, didn't I? Now I can't see you because it's too bright up here. That's okay. Now I can see my Bible. That's more important. We are in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. The title is the same as last week, Have the Same Mind. This is part two. Some people would just be glad to have any kind of a mind, but we ought to have the same one that Jesus had. Think God's thoughts after Him. Think like God thinks. I told you last week, and I'm going to remind you this week, because some of you aren't here to be reminded, but I'm going to remind you anyway, just in case you heard. If you never want to be wrong, only say what God says and you will never be wrong. When you start giving your opinions and your ideas, your wants and wishes and desires, and you start expressing those things, it won't be too long till you are wrong. You will make mistakes. You will foul up. You will screw up. You will have a disaster. But if you only say what God says, you will never be wrong because God is never wrong. Put your hand down, please. Thank you very much. And um, God is never, ever wrong, ever. Now, God never made mistakes. He came close once when he made Eve. That was funny. That was really funny. But he never made a mistake. God knows what he's doing. And what our job into, is to do in life is to learn to trust him. No matter what comes into your life. God is trustworthy. Now, if you're a Christian, you can understand that. If you're not a Christian, you just keep crying and whining and moaning and groaning and uh, feeling sorry for yourself. Go to the Burke Center, get more medication, whatever you need. But if you're a Christian, you don't need any of that. You need to learn to obey God's word. That's what you need to learn. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or a, as a busybody in other women's affairs. Oh, men's affairs, yes. Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. What? Who put that in there? Suffering according to the will of God. Did you all know that was in the Bible? Commit the keeping of your souls to him that, that uh, to him in well-doing. That means trust him as unto a faithful creator. Let's go back to verse 10. And let's see what Peter's trying to tell us. As you have received the gift means if you are saved. If you are a Christian, if you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're trusting Him for your salvation, as you have received that gift, so minister the same, that gift to others. So if you're sitting here tonight and you call yourself a Christian, my question to you would be, how many people did you try to tell about Jesus today? If you're a Christian, you were supposed to do that. That is your job. You're supposed to tell people about Jesus. You're supposed to demonstrate Jesus. Sometimes you can only get in a word sometimes with some people. But sometimes it's all it takes, you know. Like when people say to me, say, hey, how's the world treating you? I usually say, the world treats me lousy, but Jesus treats me good. And that opens the door and then they start wanting to know why I would say that. And of course, we already talked about it last week, be ready with an answer. Tell people about Jesus and live it. It doesn't do any good to tell people that Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so if you live like the devil. Because they're just not going to believe you. If you're living in adultery or you're drunk or you're doing drugs or you're a liar and a cheat. Of course, I know that's none of you. It's the people that were here last week. They did that stuff. Uh, if you do that stuff and then you try to tell people you're a Christian, they're going to laugh at you. In fact, there have been people that I have met in my life that were so screwed up and said they were Christians, I looked at them in the face and said, if you're an example of a Christian, I hope I go to hell. And that shocked them. I've met a lot of people down through the years. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people that told me they were Christians that didn't live the Christian life. The words and the walk have got to match. I'm not looking for perfect people. Nobody's perfect. I have met some people that tried to tell me they were perfect, but I watched them for a while and found out they were liars. There's no perfect people. But there is a consistency in a Christian's life. There is a willingness when you do wrong to get and receive forgiveness from other people if you need to. There's a willingness to get things straightened out when you're wrong. I had the perfect opportunity last week to get a to tell a lie and get away with it. I was in a restaurant and a man came in. He said, who owns the gray Ford out there? Yo, I do. He says, I ran into it when I was backing out. He says, I've been, uh, I've been up the front bumper. Well, I said, let's go look. So I went out there and I was real appreciative that the man was honest. But he didn't bend my front bumper. One of my employees did that. He didn't leave a mark on the truck. So you know, he may have bumped it a little bit, but he didn't do anything damage. And I first thought went through my head, say he did it and you get a free bumper. <laughs> and I know none of you have ever thought of stuff like that. But I told him, I said, sir, I said, you did not damage my bumper. One of my employees, Ricky Chandler, who is now dead, he did that. In fact, he bent the front bumper and the back bumper on that truck. He liked bending bumpers, I guess. I keep thinking I'll buy a new bumper for it, but for the last probably 12 years, I've been thinking about getting a new bumper. And it might be 12 more years before I order a new bumper. And by then, they probably won't make that bumper anymore. So then I'll just get me a piece of big pipe and weld it on the front end. 
I had an opportunity to tell a lie and get away with it. I could have got away with that. Nobody knew, not even my wife. She doesn't know what, she doesn't pay attention to bumps on cars. She, even the ones she puts on, she doesn't pay attention to. <laughs> so as you have received this gift, you have to minister to other people. That's our job. You may not be called of God to be a preacher, but you are called of God to be a reacher. And you're supposed to reach out to other people. You look for opportunities. One way that they can see that you're a Christian is when something goes wrong in your life and you're still grateful. Still thankful. Because only Christians can do that. Other people cuss. You don't do that, do you? When something goes wrong, you don't get all upset and start kicking, throwing things, breaking windows, and hitting people and getting mad because they got in your face. You know what? In 40 years, with over a million people through our three missions, I have never seen a fight between anybody that was about anything that was important. They were all stupid fights over nothing. Are you looking at me? You looking at me, man? I'll wipe that face right off your face. I'll knock you the next Tuesday. For what? A look? Most of you ain't worth looking at anyway. Get over it. Think they're looking at you. They're probably looking past you. I mean, we fight over the most ridiculous bunch of junk. I know a guy, he, he's dead now. He got stabbed over a six pack of beer and killed. Killed over a six pack of beer. And I, he called me from the from the uh, intensive care unit and they put the phone up to him to talk to me because he wanted to talk to me. He was dying. They couldn't do anything to save him. And uh, you know what he said to me? He said, Brother June, you told me so. I told him not to go down and mess with them people. I said, you're going to get in trouble. Well, the trouble got real bad. He's arguing with this boy over a six pack of beer and the daddy comes up behind and stabs him in the back. Was that really worth dying over? Well, some of you probably would go to war over a six pack of beer. I used to be that way. I'd have gone to war over a can of beer because we were cheap drunks back in the old days. <clears throat> Even so, minister the same one to another as good shepherds. We are supposed to be good shepherds of whatever God puts in our hands, in our hearts. Salvation is the first thing. And we're supposed to be telling people about the manifold grace of God. In other words, use it or lose it. And you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your rewards. And you need to understand that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, says that you can lose your reward. You can have a full reward or no reward and still get into heaven. But barely, by the skin of your teeth, just barely, as by fire is what it says in 1 Corinthians 3. <clears throat> I want to get to heaven and hopefully, hopefully my great desire is to have God look out as I'm walking up the long road and say, well done, Brother June. Come on in. I don't want to get there and God say, oh, it's you. Get over there in the corner. <laughs> leave me alone. You know. I think that's the way it's going to be for some people. They wouldn't obey God. So he says, just go, you're, you're in, you're saved, but just get over there. And they're going to be embarrassed and ashamed. I don't want to be embarrassed and ashamed. I want God to be happy with me. And I know there's a lot of things I do in my life that God, and thank God there's forgiveness. If there wasn't forgiveness, God wouldn't be happy with me at all. But there is. <laughs> I like it. If any man speak, going to speak the truth. You're supposed to speak the truth. Don't tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what God says in this book. Speak as oracles of God. Speak like you know what you're talking about. But how are you going to know what you're talking about if you don't read the book? I don't want you to raise your hands, but I want you to think. How many of you spent any amount of quality time today reading a Bible? 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I mean, some real spiritual people might have got in 30. I don't know. Think about that, because I know most of you never touched the Bible today. You don't want to know what God has to say, because when God speaks, he's probably going to tell you something you don't like. 
And that's why most people won't read the Bible. <clears throat> you're supposed to speak like you know what you're talking about. The only way you can know what you're talking about is to read the book so you can find out what you're talking about. Don't read it like some of these religions do, that Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christian Scientists, Unitarians. They twist it all around to make it fit what they want. Just read it for what it is. Believe it for what it says without somebody else being the grandfather of interpreters for you. Because most of those people haven't got a clue what they're talking about. But people follow them. Well, people follow the devil, and I don't know why they do that, except I guess they feel good about it. If any man minister, do it as of the ability which God gives. So whatever God puts in your hands, whatever God gives you to do, do it. God's given me the ability to write music and to play instruments and to sing. And I've been doing that for almost 50 years now all over the country because that's what God gave me to do. I preach a lot. He gave me that to do. He doesn't call everybody to sing. He doesn't call everybody to preach. But if whatever gift you have, it may be, and some people have the gift of money. They do. And they use it properly. That's why this place is still going. Because there's people out there who are willing to share what they've made, which is biblical, and help feed you. And they don't even know you, and you don't even know them. I don't have a bunch of money. Martin doesn't have a bunch of money. Mary and Nancy, they got all the money. And they're not going to give it to us. Nancy's saving up for a new husband, so... Well, I'm going to die one day, and she's got to buy her a husband. She's got to have enough money to buy her. I told her to buy her a retired doctor because she'll need a doctor at her age. <laughs> you might as well get one now. Whatever it is that God's giving you the ability to do, and some people have lots of abilities, and that's not always good, folks. So if you don't have too many abilities, you ought to be grateful because to whom much is given, much is required. And boy, I tell you what, God keeps me going in circles. I've lived three lifetimes already, and people say, boy, you're old. I say, you don't know the half of it. You know, I always tell people I was born in 1547, so I'm 471 years old. And they say, how come? It's because that's how many lives I've lived in this lifetime. I've written books. I've done all the stuff, TV, radio, all that junk. Found out most of it's just a big waste of time. Nobody's paying attention anyway. Joshua films all these sermons every Wednesday night, and they go on YouTube, and I think we have six people that watch them now. Or maybe it's five. We might have lost one due to death. I don't know. We have one lady that watches faithfully. She always tells me about it. I hope they don't start correcting my punch punctuation. <clears throat> so God can be glorified... How do you glorify God? Have you ever really thought about that? You know, there's other verses that say praise God. How do you praise God? How do you glorify God? Well, there's only one way. Obey Him. That's the only way you can glorify God. And so when people see you, they see Christ in you. <clears throat> but, you know, we go to these churches and the preacher gets up there and says, Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! And God's over there yawning. What a waste of time. They think it's the words and how emotional you can get has nothing to do with it. It's whether or not when you read God's word, you become a doer of the word of God, like it says in James 1.22. Be a doer of the word of God, not a hearer, only deceiving your own self. When you are a doer of the word of God, that brings praise and honor and glorifies the name of God. All the words in the world don't mean anything to God. And a good example is when you come in this building and you come check in and you say, I'm hungry and I don't have a place to stay. Would you rather have a bed and a meal or would you rather have we say, I love you? You ever known anybody to get full on I love you? I've seen a lot of people get in trouble on those words. But I've never seen anybody get a full stomach out of I love you. But you can get a full stomach out of a bowl of beans. And you see, every time somebody in this place gives you food and lets you stay here and gives you a bed and 
all the accoutrements that go with it, like showers, because you need those. I want you to take a shower. In fact, I wish everybody to take a shower before I come on Wednesday night. <laughs> Tonight, it's okay. My nose is kind of stopped up. <laughs> when, we, when we give you those things, there's no words involved, but they're saying, I love you. Because we don't have to do this. Didn't you know that? <coughs> We are not a government agency. We don't get any government funds. That's why I can't be fired. Well, I could be fired, but Martin would have to take my job, and he's doing everything he can not to get my job. So he keeps me in, you know, good standing. The truth of the matter is, folks, we do this because we care. I don't want you to go hungry. I don't want anybody to go hungry. I don't want anybody to not have a place to sleep. Although, if you break the rules, you'll end up that way. But it won't be my fault. Or Martin's fault. It'll be your own. We have never kicked out anybody because we didn't like the way they looked. Are there some people that we don't like the way they look? Yeah. I don't like any of you. <laughs> I think if this was a perfect world, everybody would look like me. <laughs> well, except the ladies. They wouldn't want to look like me. Well, yeah, they could. But with long hair. <coughs> and ruby red lips. So I don't like the way y'all look because you don't look like me. <laughs> and some of you are probably thinking, that's right on, brother, because I don't like you either. But I do love you. That means i got to treat you right. Even if I don't like you. And there are people I don't like. I mean, that's true. I don't like my wife all the time. You ever see some of the stuff she gives me for breakfast? She gave me some scrambled eggs the other day. I had to cut them with a knife. I mean, they were... <laughs> Just a joke. All right, all right. Let's get a bigger laugh out of that one. There you go. Beloved, listen carefully. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, that's test, which is to try you as though some strange things happen to you. You know, God never promised us an easy life, but you know what he did promise us? Trouble. He promised us trouble to his people, to the Christians, the lost people. He leaves them alone. He lets them do their thing. The Christians, because he wants to conform us to the image of Christ. And the only way he can do that is by putting some pain in our lives. But the Bible's very, very, very pointed. It says in Romans 5, there is no temptation or trial or test that overtakes you except that which is common to all men. And with the test, God is faithful and he will make a way of escape. So spiritually speaking, you're boxed in. You're being tested. The front door is nailed shut. The windows won't open. And you're in there and you're going to obey God. And so you obey God. And because you've obeyed God, all of a sudden a back door appears. If you don't take it, that's pretty stupid because that's why God put it there. He said, come on this way. He always makes a way of escape. Which also lets me know, and now you will know, that you don't have to sin. We sin because we choose to. I have never sinned by accident. We don't sin by accident. We sin because we make wrong choices. We sin because our flesh wants something. My flesh likes things. You know? I took my wife out on a date last night. It's the first one in 20 years. I took her to Marble Slab. I said, honey, don't fix dinner tonight. Don't cook tonight. We're going to Chicken Delight. No. I said, don't cook tonight. We're going to go to Marble Slab. We're going to eat our dinner at Marble Slab. So we got in there and we ordered two banana splits. We had to have the banana for nutrition. The rest of it was just <laughs> empty calories. Oh, they've made these big banana splits. The guy says, what kind do you want? I said, I want one like I used to get back in the 50s, 60s, traditional. You know, 
vanilla ice cream, strawberry ice cream, chocolate ice cream, banana, got to have banana, you know, and, and some, pe he says, what kind of nuts do you want? I said, what kind of nuts did they used to put on them? He said, peanuts. I said, then put peanuts on it and whipped cream. And the guy didn't have a cherry. He's supposed to have a cherry. Oh, man. He was out of cherries. I'm sorry, we're out of cherries. I said, put it all back. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I said, well, then you got strawberries. He said, yeah. I said, put a strawberry on it. I want something red on top. <laughs> and we ate and ate and ate. And we were full. Little banana splits were full. And I don't even know why I'm telling you this story, except I took my wife out there because I didn't want her to cook. <laughs> it's too hot to cook. Come on. Beloved, trials are coming. God promises you expect trials. If you expect trials, you don't get too excited about them. You know that? Jesus went to the cross, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. Well, what does that mean? It means he knew that there was a resurrection after the crucifixion. So he went to the cross knowing that he was not going to stay in the grave. He was a coming out. And he had a big coming out party. And boy, did he have one because when he rose from the dead, the graves all around opened up and people that had been dead for a long time came out of those graves and everybody in town was going, ah, you see that? Zombies walking around is like the walking dead. Well, they were better looking though. Rejoice. Rejoice. Be happy. Inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Why? Because you went through the test that God put in your life and you passed them. You pass the test, then you can rejoice, and God's going to be extremely happy with you. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, you tell somebody, say you're at the mall, and you walk up to somebody and say, I want to give you this piece of literature, maybe a little gospel track. I want to let you know Jesus loves you. And then they cuss you out. I've had that happen a bunch. I can't even tell you how many times. He says, happy are ye. Happy. No, most of us go, oh. <laughs> I tried to help those people. <laughs> And they turned on me. <laughs> God's going to say, shut up and grow up. We're supposed to be happy. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 says, be thankful always for all things. I don't like people to cuss me out. But I have learned over the years to let them go ahead and get done and then say, thank you. Because that makes them mad. <laughs> I didn't do that intending to make them mad. I just found out it does. <laughs> Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. They may not like you, but it's kind of like what happened to me one time in Nacogdoches. We started God Tell. The downtown merchants hated us. They, didn't, they wanted to get rid of us. They didn't want a homeless shelter in Nacogdoches. The preachers in the churches, they didn't want a homeless shelter in Nacogdoches. They denied that there was any need for a homeless shelter. People sleeping under bridges and eating out of dumpsters, but that didn't count. That's what was going on when we came in 1972 and 3. <clears throat> and uh, people come along and they get mad, they get upset, they get mad at you, curse you out, reproach you for Christ's sake. And I had to learn how to get happy because it's a choice. God says, and it's a commandment, happy are ye. But no, that's not what most people want to do. They call themselves Christian. Why, well, people get in my face, I'll just show them what's for. And they start waving their arm. I'm going to fight and be like Fred Sanford boxing the air. You know? <clears throat> Suffering is part of being a Christian. And you need to know that you can trust God, even when horrible things happen in your life. I told you about her mother and the death of their child when he was two, and how God turned that into a ministry in her life. And it was able to help all kinds of women that lost children. 
And people always say, well, isn't this terrible? That little baby's dying. I say, why don't you just leave it alone and say, Lord, your will be done, not mine. And if the baby dies, get happy about it. And they look at me like I'm crazy. In the church, I'm talking about. They look at me like I'm crazy. I say, how do you know that's not the next Hitler? What a different world this would have been if Hitler would have dialed it, died at childbirth. No, instead, here he comes, the monster of the world, right? And all the women are going, ooh, look at the little baby. Hey, look at him, he's so cute. Look at those little toes. Look at the... And he was a monster. I mean, anybody want to deny that? He grew up, he killed six million Jewish people. I don't know how many of his own people. Stalin killed 12 million of his own people. He's a monster. We got a lot of monsters. We're all monsters, but those are monsters that got in power. And people say, oh, well, it's horrible for a little child to die. You don't know that. God knows that. And it could be that God's trying to spare the world some more misery. Could be. You don't know. So you have to learn. God, I don't understand everything. I don't like everything. But I know I can trust you. <clears throat> but if <clears throat> but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, busybody. In other words, don't cause your own problem. You're supposed to be doing what's right. Then if God brings all them trials into your life, you can trust God to take care of things. But if you cause the problem, God will let you reap what you sowed. I remember in 1971 when I became a Christian, I was in jail in Orange County, Southern California. And you know, it's very funny. I was in a place where there was 5,000 people, 300 on the two-level tier I was on, and they were all innocent. That was a weird experience. Nobody admitted to be, being guilty about, of anything except one guy who had shot a police officer and he was everybody's hero. When I got saved, I realized that I had caused my pain and I put myself there and it was my own fault and if I stayed there the rest of my life, then it would be okay. That's where I deserved to be. And when I told some of the people in there that I was guilty, they got mad. Don't say that. But it was true. Sometimes being guilty, getting to the end of yourself is a good place to be. <coughs> but if you suffer as a Christian, yeah. huh, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf by giving thanks. For the time has come that judgment must begin, look at this, at the house of God. You know what that means? When God's judgment comes, he's going to start with the preachers. And there's going to be a whole lot of sad preachers on Judgment Day. I think, I really believe this, that God's going to start with the TV preachers. Judge them first. There's a few good ones there, but you've got to find them. Judgment begins at the house of God. God starts with his own people. Or better yet, let me say it this way, the people who say they are his people. Because most of the people that say they are his people are not his people. <coughs> and if we first begins with us, then what's going to be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, the answer to that is real simple. It's another four-letter word. Hell. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, barely get saved. Because, see, we don't have any righteousness. The only righteousness we end up with is that which Jesus implants upon us when we receive him as our Lord and Savior. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Those are the Christians. God never promised you an easy life. TV preachers, they promise you an easy life. Come to Jesus. All your problems will be over. Let me tell you a secret. You come to Jesus, your troubles will just get started good. But it'll be glorious when you learn the lessons and you start growing through your Christian life and 10, 20, 30, 40 years goes by and all of a sudden you realize you're not the same person that started on this journey. You won't be. You'll be a different person. 
Oh, you look the same. I'm sorry, I can't help you there. <laughs> but you won't be the same person. When I got saved, I was a different person. I've been a different person since 1971. I look the same. Well, I don't look the same now. I got old. Back then, I was really good looking. I got pictures. I can prove it. I had hair. Dark, long hair, flowing. Wore strange clothes compared to today. I used to wear moccasins, tall moccasins with fringe and fringe coats. And uh, had the American flag sewn on my butt of my pants. I had a dove sewn on the front and other things. I remember coming to East Texas from Los Angeles. I walked into Fredonia Hill Baptist Church up in Nacogdoches, and Mike Perry, who has become a good friend of mine, Mike Perry looked at his wife, Betty, and he said, Betty, if there was ever a person that ain't going to make it, there he is. I fooled him because God was there with me. So if you suffer according to the will of God, which it is the will of God that we suffer so we can be tested, so we can complete the journey, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. In other words, trust Jesus. You want to go to heaven? We sing a song. I want to go to heaven when I die and I'm on my way. A lot of people want to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. How else are you going to get there? First, you've got to die to self. That's painful. That's what the suffering is. Doing what you're supposed to do instead of what you feel like doing. And please don't be like some people have done to me. They come in, Brother June, you don't understand. I have an agreement with God. And I can smoke and drink and run around and do anything I want to do. God said it's okay for me to do those things. He's going to forgive me in the end. And I said, I got a Greek word for you. And that guy said, what? This is true. He said, what? And I said, <laughs> I have another Greek word too, baloney. Y'all didn't know that was a Greek word, did you? Folks, you don't make agreements with God. You either obey Him or you don't. And remember, John 8.32 says the truth will set you free. A lie will put you in bondage. Now let me quickly end with this little story. It's a true story. It's in the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Y'all remember them. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He became the father of the Israelite people. He had 12 sons. The 12 sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. One of his sons, the second to the last one, was named Joseph. Joseph was his favorite son. And so daddy made him some zoot suits. He sewed them himself and everything. A coat of many colors. Joseph had visions. And he told his family, he says, I had a vision. And all my brothers bowed down to me. Well, that made them mad. And then later on, he had another vision. He said, and mom and dad bowed down to me. Oh, that made them mad. They didn't like that. Well, one day, the brothers were all out tending the sheep, except for Benjamin, because he was the youngest and he was still on the bottle. And um, Joseph was told by Daddy, take this food and go down there for your brothers there. And he told them where they were in Dothan. And he went. And they saw him come and they said, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him. See what happens to his visions. Well, Reuben, the oldest, he didn't want to kill him. So he said, don't kill him. So they took him and they put him in this pit. And they all sat around trying to figure out what they were going to do. And then an Ishmaelite trading caravan was coming by on its way to Egypt. And they said, look, if we kill him, we don't get anything. Let's sell him. And they sold their brother into bondage going into Egypt. They took his coat. They killed an animal and put some blood on it. They never said anything to daddy. They just said, is this your son's coat or not? And then he saw it and saw the blood on the coat, instantly jumped to the conclusion that Joseph was dead. Was Joseph dead? No. And for 20 years, 20 years, that man grieved for his son. He would not be comforted, grieved, mourned for that son. For 20 years, was, Jacob de was Joseph dead? No, he was in Egypt moving up the chain of command. <laughs> 
finally became second in command to Egypt. What did his daddy do? He believed a lie. And because he believed the lie, it ruined his life. And that's what some of you have done, and that's what got you here. Because somewhere back there in your life, you believed lies. People that commit crimes, for instance, don't ever think they're going to get caught. Did you know that? If they knew they were going to get caught, they wouldn't do it. They think they're going to get away with it. They believe what? A lie. A lie. People who smoke, some of you smoke, well, maybe you'll all quit tonight, I don't know. But uh, I've had to bury people with lung cancer that were young. I've had to bury people that were young that died of cirrhosis of the liver. And you probably think it'll never happen to you. Some of you it will, and you know what? If it happens to you, I hope you leave a will letting me preach your funeral so I can tell everybody how sorry you were for believing a lie. It's a lie. Right now, the things that you're doing to your body and cigarettes and drinking, it's destroying you. You may not feel it all at once because it happens so gradual until one day you just fall over dead. And I've watched people like that, and some of them die pretty quick. Within a few months, they're dead. You know, they were, they were like perfect health, looked like perfect health, puffing away, drinking, having sexual activity they shouldn't have, and then they get sick from that. Some of you have probably already been there, too. Don't get the T-shirt. You don't need to advertise that. If you believe a lie, a lie will put you in bondage and eventually destroy you. If you believe the truth, which is in God's word, it will set you free. And you will end up with all the trials of life and hell by the acre being a happy camper. Father, we thank you for loving us. And I do thank you for each one in this room tonight. <clears throat> and I hope they're paying attention. Because I'm not preaching this for me. I've already surrendered. I'm trying to help them. To know you, to understand. You gave us a very, very good potential for life. But all across the world, people are destroying it. Over nothing. Ideologies. Religion. Religion will sure kill you. People suffering all over the world because one group wants what the other group has. Watching that movie today, it was a true story about Hitler, Hitler stealing all the artworks in Europe and hiding them. And some of those artworks, because the Germans lost the war, they destroyed them. Their attitude was, if we can't have them, neither will you. And you know, there's people in here, we don't have those great artworks, but some of our attitudes are the same. I'm going to do what I want, and I don't care who I hurt. We hope that they realize that if they trust Jesus, he'll change them. And he changed their heart, their mind, everything about them. And always for the better. We thank you for the salvation that you've offered us, a great gift, the resurrection from the dead, to prove that there's more than what this life shows, and a promise to return. And we look forward to you. We ask you to bless this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.